Max, I really want to know what really exists. What are the broad categories of stuff of reality? Roger Penrose, great guy, talks about three worlds. A world of mathematics, which is really real in some platonic heaven. And that world of mathematics creates the world of matter. The world of matter creates the world of mind. And then the world of mind creates mathematics. And somehow we're going round and round in this circle. Help me through this. Yeah, this is a fascinating paradox. I first learned about it when I went to Roger Penrose's lecture in Munich back when I was a postdoc. And it has haunted me ever since. And later on, when I was a uh, back in the U.S. doing a postdoc, two colleagues of mine and I, Pete Hutt and Mark Alford, would start arguing about this at lunch. And what was really interesting about this was, here we are at this table, three card-carrying theoretical physicists, very similar background, very similar training, and we realized that we not only disagreed with each other, but we did so passionately. And <laughs> the three of us had almost diametrically opposite views on what's really going on with life, the universe, and everything. <laughs> and uh, we had so much fun arguing about this that we even wrote it up as a little three-way <laughs> trialogue argument. And it's, uh, to me, one of the great things about physics that it's not an a monoculture of ideas where you have to necessarily whack others over the head because they don't agree, but rather where it's a strength, really, in my mind, that people come at things from different points of view. Now, you're looking at the same data. You yeah. all agree on the same data. You all have the same worldview about the primacy of science. And yet, when you come up with the grand overview of how do you make sense out of this, you have these dramatically different views. Yeah, so the first thing to take away from that is, of course, if someone ever tells you right that oh, according to physics, uh, this is how it is. You, know? <laughs> you should completely dismiss that kind of self-proclaimed ambassadors for physics because there is no <laughs> consensus view there, right? Okay. And, and the second thing which I think is great is that whereas in other areas it's a problem if people disagree, here it's good because ultimately you work hardest on the things that you really ex believe in and are excited about, yeah, right? Yeah. And the fact that different people are pursuing very different kinds of questions because they're motivated by thinking it is very different, makes it much more likely that we as a community are going to succeed than if we had some kind of ontological monoculture and we're all saying this is what we're going to do and we're not going to think about it. I totally else. agree. But now I want you to get into the details. I want to know the three separate positions that you guys have regarding the structure of this ultimate reality. Okay, so Mark Alford, he is the most pragmatic of the three of us and uh, basically argued that physics and science it's supposed to be useful. And it's essentially, a bag. math is basically a bag of tricks which we should use to build airplanes and, and model things when it works. And, we, and uh, we shouldn't worry about any deeper meaning. When I talked about fundamental underlying reality, he joked that reality doesn't lie under anything. It's really, you know, right here in your face for you to see, right? And, and that, that's a view that, that, that you, there is no underlying reality, or we can never know an underlying reality, or maybe it's there but it doesn't matter, or, or all of the above. Or all of the above, or that we just, that's just not science to think about those things. It's not science to think and about. And it was clear, Mark didn't really care much about for that kind of question, mm -hmm. ultimately. Yeah. And whereas um, I, feel very strongly that I think there is something more deep and underlying to understand. And not only do I feel that, but hey, that's why I decided to go into this career, <laughs> even though I could probably get paid more to do something else. You know? But I love thinking about these big questions. That's really what drives me. So, uh, and the third position? And the th so, my, so my position was that math is the fundamental thing, mm. which then describes perfectly how matter behaves and then we are made out of matter. Pete Hutt's position was that all of these three were really just different facets of something else, just somehow deeper oh. and underlying. Most, a little bit like people used to argue about electricity and magnetism as being two different things. Until you found. Until Maxwell realized that it's all unified into electromagnetism. So you have then three different positions to look at this 
paradox of math, matter, and mind. The first was that uh, it's maybe not so relevant that we can use ideas to make things, that, but this underlying reality, we don't know. Your view is more that there isn't a something there. I want to find it. I'm desperate to find it. And maybe it's, it's related to mathematics. So, so in this three of math, matter, and mind, you're a math guy. I'm a math guy. And you're math saying first. the math is the first, and that's the generator. So it's not really a, a circle. Or you have this Bermuda Triangle, right, which you, clearly you can't have an infinite loop. Right. So you've got to cut somewhere. I would cut off the link that goes from mind, mind to matter. I don't think math is something that we have invented. I think math is something we discover. From mind to math you cut off. Sorry, from mind to math we cut off, right. I don't think we invent the cube or the dodecahedron. I think we discover that these platonic solids are there and I think it's exactly the same with the integers and all of the other math objects that people will study in a math department. I there, think there's a landscape of, of things out there and that they are really them. real, that they're they're necessary. They've always been there in some way, uh, yes, and that we're, and we're outside finding space it and time. as opposed to creating. It's yes. not some construct of the human mind. Precisely. So that's where you make the snip. I feel they have this feel to them that if you kick them, then you kick back. <laughs> you know, they're there. So you start with the math, and then that math somehow generates the matter, and then the matter generates the mind. That's right, because what we've come to realize in theoretical physics is that at a very abstract level, all our equations for what the universe is or just equations describing certain mathematical objects. You will hear people say that our space is a three plus one dimensional pseudo Riemannian manifold. You know, that's a math object. I won't even ask you what that means. No, don't worry about <laughs> what it means. But the, the important thing, of course, is that, that uh, we've more and more come to identify our physical world with these same kind of mathematical objects like the cube, just a little more complicated. <laughs> Well, what's fascinating to me is that when you deal with those three worlds and in, in Roger Penrose's system, all three worlds are real and, and all have a, 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 what they say is a, an independent ontology, an independent being. They're all real. And you can find people in today's world who, who would say only one of those are real. Yes. And you can find people who say two of those are real. Pick up any two. So you get any combination you want. And then what you're saying, it, it, what your colleague did, is he said those three, that none of them are really fundamentally real, that they're all related to something else that we don't know what is. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so of all of these possibilities. I personally prefer sticking my neck out a little bit because if one says that, it's a, then uh, if I say I don't know what it is, how, how do you falsify it? I prefer sort of going for broke and hoping that it's all math because if it is there is this little glimmer of hope that in our lifetime we might find those equations which actually describe not just this math but describe then everything so you might also call me an incurable optimist but <laughs> if we're gonna even if we're gonna ultimately fail you know in this quest to figure out the big question of life the universe and everything at least I would prefer to go down swinging, <laughs> at least go down trying your best. Tell me this, suppose you're right, suppose you find those equations yes. and that math seems to generate matter and matter the rest, what would that mean? Well, it would mean great news for theoretical physics in the sense that there is really a hope that we humans may actually be able to figure out life, the universe and everything, right? Which is not at all a given if you take into account that my brain was evolved really to eat bananas and that kind of things, right? <laughs> and uh, on the other hand, I don't think it would mean the end of science, the end of physics, because there's still going to be a wealth of problems where we know what the equations are. Like, for instance, we know the equations for how water moves, the Navier-Stokes equations. We still can't figure out turbulence of the Niagara Falls from that, or let alone how our minds work. So. I think it would be a very natural closure to the search for something very fundamental, but leave open all these fascinating questions as to what the implications are for real practical things. To me, that if we find those equations in, in a few thousand years of human history that we have recorded, maybe a few hundred thousand years of just human existence, and a few hundred years of science, yes. that we found the fundamental structure of the universe is, to me, baffling. I find it absolutely mind-blowing also that uh, 
we humans have managed to come so far. On the other hand, my main cause for optimism is just to see how far we've come in the last 100 years, right? When my grandma was a kid, they didn't even know there were other galaxies. And now we can start talking about what the universe did when it was less than a trillionth of a second old. That's progress. <laughs>